First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview for the Thai audience. And the first thing we have to do with um, Dr. Lawrence Cushy is having him introduce himself because his profession is so complicated. Um, I, I don't even know how to explain it nicely. So please introduce yourself sure. and uh -huh. where you went to school and how you come to be epidemiologist. Right, an epidemiologist. Epidemiologist. Right. Okay, right. thank you, please. Okay, so uh, thank you. Vanessa for the introduction. Uh, my name is Larry Cushy, or Lawrence Cushy more formally, uh, and I have a doctoral degree uh, in epidemiology. Uh, the degree, actually the, my degree is in nutrition, but my profession and all the work that I do is epidemiologic research. So what is epidemiology? Epidemiology is really the study of the, the distributions and the factors that result in uh, uh, disease in human populations, and also looking at outcomes for people who have developed disease. And so what I am more specifically is, with a degree in nutrition and doing all my work in epidemiology, I'm what's considered a nutritional epidemiologist, which means that I look at dietary factors and associated uh, activities like, like physical activity, body size, et cetera, and how that might be related to development of chronic diseases, and more specifically, most of the work that I've done uh, and I, I continue to do is in cancer, and more specifically in that context, in breast cancer. But I've been involved in studies in a lot of other areas as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. And where do you work at mm -hmm. now? Yeah, so the place that I'm employed is Kaiser Permanente of Northern California. Kaiser is a healthcare provider in uh, the United States. Uh, it's one of the largest healthcare providers in the state of California. Uh, has less of a presence elsewhere in the United States, but it does provide care in several other uh, regions in the United mm -hmm. States. It provides both the health insurance coverage as well as provides the clinical care. And so it's known as an integrated healthcare system mm -hmm. where all the care is provided overall, the, both the uh, uh, specialty care as well as the primary care. Uh, so, uh, so I work there. Uh, but the uh, organization itself that I'm directly f affiliated with has a division of research. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in the division of research, so I don't provide clinical care per se, mm -hmm. but I conduct research related to food and nutrition and how that's related to cancer development and what happens after cancer diagnosis. Yes. And, and so you receive funding um, mm -hmm. every year from. Yeah, where? so. Yeah, so I. The way. I find that so interesting. Yeah, like, the way we conduct our studies is we come up with these research ideas, you know, based on what we've done in the past, what mm -hmm. other people are doing, and we apply for research grants. So uh, all the funding that I have for my research comes from the National Cancer Institute, uh, which mm -hmm. is a federal government agency. Uh, and uh, so we have to write these grants, and then that helps support actually part of our salaries and mm. the salaries of all our research staff and everything like that. Uh, but those are the those are the dollars that uh, help to support the projects that I do. So, for example, I'd say yes. one major research project I have right now is looking at 4,500 women who were diagnosed with breast cancer, who mm. were following forward over time. We're collecting information. We enroll them into the study soon after they were diagnosed with breast cancer, and we're collecting information on their dietary habits, physical activity patterns, use of uh, unconventional or uh, mm. alternative. Uh, therapies for their cancer, use of supplements. Uh, we're also collecting information on their clinical care. Actually, because all these women were diagnosed in Kaiser Permanente, we, have, we can access their uh, medical records so that we can get detailed information about all the treatments they're receiving. Uh, we can also have access to other conditions that they may have, if they maybe have diabetes or cardiovascular disease or that type of thing, and how that might influence what happens mm -hmm. uh, subsequently. Uh, we also collected, you know, sort of blood samples and other things. So we're genotyping all the women currently in the, uh, who are enrolled in this study. So we'll be able to look at multiple different factors. We're also linking up with air, what are known as area level or contextual geospatial databases so uh, that can help characterize the communities that they live in uh, mm -hmm. and uh, everything from sort of uh, the distance from their healthcare providers uh, to things like, you know, the built environment opportunities for mm -hmm. activity, uh, also their social networks and other things like that. So, so those are all the types of things we're looking at. Uh, and 
so anyway, that's an example of a study. That's funded yes. by the National Cancer Institute. We have collaborators of, at a number of different institutions that help in different aspects. So all the genotyping, for example, is being done at Johns Hopkins, but it's being led by collaborators at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, which is in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, anyway, those are what we're doing. doing and right it's now. funded by the National Cancer It's about two million a year uh, for doing this work. Uh, and it's an ongoing study. And so that's an example of what the type what of work that type of work that you do. Yeah. So I will have so many questions about um, <laughs> nutrition and cancer, um, especially breast cancer, first of mm -hmm. all, because um, it's something that, that women in Thailand are worried about the most and and mm -hmm. for me too. So a few questions. Um, it will be milk, soy, and supplements, definitely. So let's mm -hmm. do in order. Okay. Um, what are your recommendations for consuming dairy for mm -hmm. women like me who are concerned with you know developing breast yeah. cancer? Yeah, so so milk is uh, is a really, and dairy food, you know, foods that are made from milk, yogurt, cheese, et cetera. You know, there's, it's, in the overall cancer context, it's kind of kind of uh, interesting. Uh, another one of the things that I've done professionally in the context of uh, the fact that I do this type of research, I've been invited to participate in committees related to the development of uh, nutrition recommendations or food recommendations for uh, uh, food choices and nutrition and cancer prevention as well as cancer prognosis, and so. In the breast cancer specific context, mm -hmm. uh, there's relatively, but there's basically not much evidence that dairy food per se might result in increased mm -hmm. likelihood of developing breast cancer. Uh, but but the, there's sort of there's been a change in the way that dairy uh, that milk dairy cows are milked in uh -huh. in at least the United States context, and I don't know how much that's uh, changed uh, internationally. Uh, and, but so, for example, you know, if you just think in general about breastfeeding or delivering milk for feeding your babies, babies, you know, yeah, like human, human, right? Whether you're a human yes. or a cow, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, it's the same uh, thing, right? Like, right, basically, mm -hmm. uh, it sort of acts as a natural sort of uh, contraceptive in a sense. It becomes more difficult to become pregnant, you mm -hmm. know, uh, if you're breastfeeding, uh, at least during that period, <coughs> and of course, you know. In order to produce milk, you need to have given birth, you know, and so dairy cows have given birth to, you know, uh, to baby cows, cow. right? Yeah. Baby cows, yeah. no? and then they can, you know, milk the cows, you know, and they do that for a while and that type of thing, you know, and and then uh, <coughs> and then there's a period where they don't milk the cows, you know, and then they uh, have to wait, you know, for the cows to give birth again before they can milk them again. So in order to shorten that waiting period. You know what they now do in many dairy cows is they artificially inseminate the cows while they're still lactating. Being lactating, oh, right? Yes. Exactly, giving milk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, ordinarily, uh, it's pretty relatively difficult to become pregnant during that time period as a mammal, uh, and during pregnancy, because you're supporting the growth of a fetus, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're a cow or a human or other mammal, uh, your your estrogen levels mm. that you're creating internally, you know, mm. in terms of your endogenous production is increased dramatically, mm. way more than if you like take our taking hormone pills, you know, estradiol pills or something like that. Dramatic increases because it's a natural physiological need for supporting the growth of a fetus. Okay. And so so that's so if you artificially inseminate a cow you know, during that time period, and then the and you're still milking, milking the cow, yeah. then the really high levels of estrogens get into the milk. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the milk from that come from cows that have been artificially inseminated and therefore are pregnant while they're being milked, the estrogen levels in that milk are substantially higher than if if they weren't pregnant during that time. I well, see. Way much higher, substantially higher, and so. Uh, a majority of cows now, or the dairy, the milk that comes onto the market, come from those cows in the United States, pregnant cows, and so, uh, and that wasn't the sort of the traditional way of you know of milking, uh, milking cows. cows. You yes. know, I mean, it would be done more naturally. You wouldn't have the artificial insemination, so they wouldn't be pregnant during most of the time that you're milking them. Mm -hmm. So the estrogen levels would be really substantially lower. And the estrogen uh -huh. level is a problem because yeah, like um, okay, so 
okay. and the reason is... Am I ever getting ahead <laughs> right. of myself? Okay. Because, so so mm-hmm. there, there is a lot of estrogen in cows. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. In the milk. Right. In the milk. Right. Okay. And it also survives, you know, like if you make it into cheese or whatever, so... Okay. Uh-huh. And save my students, like little boys or girls or even mm-hmm. women like me, go and consume those mm-hmm. things with very high estrogen mm-hmm. level. What, yeah, what do so, you think of that? So the concern is that we know that high estrogen levels, like if you're uh, not so much taking like oral contraceptives, because mm-hmm. that just sort of mimics sort of the level of mm-hmm. estrogens that uh, women who might potentially become pregnant, you know, sort of have already. But we know, for example, sometimes when women go have go through menopause, you know, in order to alleviate sort of the symptoms that occur with that, that results from decreases in estrogen levels, you know, that are produced by the ovaries because mm-hmm. they're no longer going to be functioning. Uh, they may have symptoms and that type of thing. So sometimes people are given hormone replacement therapy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to alleviate those symptoms. We know that women who are given those have higher likelihood of developing breast cancer. So similarly, oh uh-huh. it may be that if now that you know a large proportion of the dairy supply in the United States is, are going to have higher estrogen levels, maybe it's possible that that will result in higher rates of breast cancer in people who eat a lot of dairy. Now, we don't know that in a definitive fashion at this moment, but there's still, there are some suggestions that that might actually be the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so that's something that we're sort of concerned about from a health perspective. Um, we also know that uh, in many studies uh, conducted uh, that more dairy food is, is, is associated with greater likelihood of developing prostate cancer. Oh my God, uh, let's touch on that because I shouldn't okay. be asking only for oh, okay, females, sorry. right? <laughs> right? So for male, <laughs> right, like so that's, if, if they're right. male watching, um, mm-hmm. so how would you recommend um, your male counterpart about dairy consumption and um, prostate mm-hmm. cancer? Yeah. So, you know, if you're really concerned about prostate cancer, if you have a high risk of prostate cancer, perhaps because you have a family history or something like that, uh, then maybe that's something that you might want to consider. You know, but in terms of overall cancer risk, we also know that uh, eating more dairy food, milk uh, in particular, but dairy food in general, is probably associated with lower likelihood of developing colon cancer, colorectal cancer, large bowel cancer. And so, uh, so what should men, what should men decide? Because yeah. if they if they want to lower the risk of colon cancer, they should consume milk. But then they might be at risk of prostate cancer. Right. And exactly. both of them are like really not good to have. Right. So but yeah. what should they do? Yeah. So from that so from that perspective, you know, Stop when I like... when I've sat on these guidelines development committees or whatever, yes. it's kind of like, okay, I guess we can't really come up with an overall recommendation <laughs> for cancer generally, you know, yeah. because for some cancers, maybe it's a concern. For others, maybe it's actually beneficial. But it's you one know. body, right? Right. So it's, so, it's, right. So it's hard. Yeah. And and maybe you know there are other considerations that you might want to bring in. But strictly from an overall cancer uh-huh. risk perspective, what should we do? There's, there's really no recommendation one way or another. So the committee doesn't want to say anything because right. you can, you can't say one way or another. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, we could you know sort of say okay, overall you know colon cancer is the most one of the most common cancers in both men and women, mm. and prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers in men. men. You know, you know, and maybe you know if we look at the possible relationships, mm-hmm. like I was suggesting, maybe in breast cancer, but you know there's really not good evidence at this point, but reason for concern. Um, but there is good no. evidence for prostate cancer. Right, for prostate cancer that and for colon, colon cancer, the evidence I'd say is pretty consistent. Okay, uh-huh. so as a researcher, is it um, comfortable for you to say like milk is a is a big concern for people who might, you know, develop prostate cancer, and for them to mm-hmm. be aware of that? Yeah, I think I think if that is of concern, then I think that it's definitely something that you know people may want to take into account. Yeah, okay. for sure. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you do? What is your decision yeah. for yourself? So for myself, yes. you know, so I will say that, you know, uh, as you might be able to tell, uh, I, my ancestry is from Japan. Uh, <laughs> in, in Japan, uh, there's not, traditionally, not much dairy food that was consumed. You know, it really became uh, the first sort of cows came to Japan, not that I live in Japan or have ever lived there, but they first came, you know, when uh, Japan was sort of opened up, so to speak, you know, Mm -hmm. in the um, 19th century, you know, and, uh, you know, this agricultural university was started in Hokkaido and, you know, whatever, and they brought some cows and that type of thing. Right, exactly. You know, so, 
so it wasn't part of traditional Japanese cuisine until very recently when you think about you know sort of the you know even sort of in, uh, you know written you know, history or whatever uh, so uh, so it's not really a part of traditional Japanese cuisine that and much of what I was raised at I, I'll say the word here but I was raised macrobiotically but my parents were from Japan and a lot of macrobiotic teachings were uh, and the food that we ate were very Japanese influenced, uh, and so uh, we didn't have dairy food, you know, when I was raised up, being raised, and so I first encountered like cheese and whatever and milk, you know, like when I started having friends in elementary school and that type of thing. So, um, so it's never been a part of my, what I consume in a regular basis. It's been more a social thing, you know. Uh, like wine. Yeah, exactly. Like wine. I. I cons Drink wine in the same way, you know, maybe with like friends and dinner too. or whatever. And right, and fish too, you know. Uh, so, so those are things that I don't consume regularly, but I don't necessarily sort of, you know, totally say no way, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in in terms of what I may consume. But like, I don't really have dairy at home, you know, for example, cooked with it or anything like that. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't drink milk at all. Period. I don't care for the taste of it. You know, cheese I, is okay. You know, maybe you know, but. Uh, you know, but again, only in, like in these social so, occasions. Social you know, occasions. So. Since, okay, you have mm -hmm. a question. Uh, you show the graph of uh, prostate cancer versus skim milk. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. you were shocked. The, the trend was pretty clear. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, my question is that um, what kind of intake are we looking at? Do we need to take gallons of it to show that trend? Oh, or yeah. Like oh, the quantity, day? right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so okay. Let, let, let me recap that question okay. a little bit in my voice so we can put it in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, I remember the lecture that you were talking about skim milk mm -hmm. and prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Can you address on that um, yeah. research a little bit? Thank yeah, you. so, so uh, the research that I'm really referring to primarily are the types of studies that I do, which are epidemiologic studies. Uh, and more specifically, their study, most of the research or most of the evidence that we look to comes from what are known as prospective cohort studies. And so those are studies in which we enroll Typically, when we're looking at development of cancer, tens of thousands of people, uh, uh, in this case it would be men if we're interested in prostate cancer yes, development. Uh, and, and then when we enroll them into the study, invite them into the study, then we would collect information from them about the, their food patterns and, and their food intake. And so typically we would ask people, how much milk do you drink, how often, you know, and what, what quantities, how much skim milk, you know, how, how much cheese, you know, whatever, as well, well as all, a lot of other different foods. Mm -hmm. And then we follow these men forward over time, and then we see, okay, which of these men ended up developing prostate cancer and which ones did not? You know, of course, only a small proportion will in any given year mm -hmm. to get prostate cancer because, you know, even though it's a common cancer, you know, cancers in general are, don't occur a lot, I mean, over yeah. a lifetime, yeah, uh, you know, right. large proportion, but not any in any given year. You know, and so ultimately, you know, we will have some men have developed prost prostate cancer, and some men and many men will have not. And so, what we can do is we can take the people. You know, we can look at what they reported in terms of what they, like for example, skim milk. Some people would have said, "Okay, we we're eating skim milk, you know, every day." Other people will say, "I never drink skim milk." No. And then there are other people in between. Oh, I drink it, you know, like once a week or a couple times a week or something like that, you know. And then we can categorize people according to how frequently they and the amount that they consume, you mm -hmm. know. And then we can look at the prostate cancer rates in each of those groups. So the people who are drinking skim milk every single day, what's their prostate cancer rate? The people who never drink skim milk, what's their prostate cancer rate? Or, you know, we could do the same thing with dairy food generally, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so when we compare people who consume more skim milk or more frequently, you know, to people who drink less skim milk or less frequently, then we see that, yeah, there's this increased likelihood. I mean, those men have a higher rate of prostate cancer than the other other men, you know. And so, so there are a number of studies now that have done that and looked at this question, you know. And uh -huh. so that's where, you know, these relationships come from, you know, that there's this clear relationship across all of these studies, you know, that more skim milk is associated with more dairy, more prostate cancer, and dairy food in general is associated with more prostate cancer. You know, so across these types of studies, and these are the strongest studies that, uh, in terms of study design and being able to infer whether there's a causal relationship, uh, just short of being able to 
to actually conducting intervention studies, and those types of studies have not been done in this area. Mm -hmm. But part of what makes us have more confidence is that there are there's a, there is more than one study, and we've done them in mm -hmm. uh, not right. we me personally, no, but the <laughs> research community <laughs> the research have community. done yeah. done these in you know different uh, stud different populations and different you know. Uh, countries and other things like that and it's a relatively it's a pretty consistent finding and so when you see something again and again in different studies and different populations then it gives you greater confidence that what you're what you observed in this one study is actually describing some real phenomenon you know not just a chance finding or something mm -hmm. um, when you were mentioning milk and skim milk mm -hmm. then automatically I would think of something that Thai men consume a lot when they want to build, want to build muscle, mm -hmm. which is um, whey. Oh, whey. Uh -huh. Whey okay. and whey when isolates protein, and everything right. like that, yeah. per protein yeah. from mm -hmm. um, milk. Can I make a generalization and and assume that whey is, you know, some type of the spectrum of the dairy yeah, product? So so that's that's actually a good point uh, or Should a good I question. I advise the muscle men in Thailand that they're, yeah, they might so be at risk or not. Yeah, so that's actually a good question. Uh, you know, are they at increased risk of prostate cancer? You know, these studies don't necessarily directly point to what component of skim milk or whatever is associated with is with that increased prostate cancer risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little difficult to say it may be the way or whatever, but we definitely do know that you know. It, that's still remaining in the skim milk, you know, we, skim milk basically from whole milk is just getting rid of the milk fat. Uh, so, um, so the milk fat per se, you know, I mean, there may be other reasons to not want to drink a lot of milk fat, you know, or whatever, but, you know, the prostate cancer relationship seems to hold up, you know, even when you've removed that part. Of milk. So, so it's not you know. just the fat, it's right. something uh -huh. that's left after the fat. Right, exactly. Okay. So it may be related to some of the proteins in milk or whatever, but, you know, these studies per se can't say what it is definitively, but it can say that these foods, you know, are yeah, consumption food. of them right. are definitely uh, related. So, um, so they, 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 mm -hmm. might ha they might look, they, they might, they, sh they might sh study further into whether you yeah, know, they should consume whey right. or not if they're trying to build muscles. Right, yeah, so so in order to be able to look at that, and I, I personally haven't actually looked into this literature you know, mm. too deeply, but you know, you could conduct like other studies where you actually feed people whey and then look at, you know, prostate or, cancer or not, to, not so much look at prostate cancer because it takes decades for that to develop, but you can look at maybe, you know, sort of other biomarkers that, mm. that might be associated with increased, you know, prostate cancer risk, or you could do it in animals, you know, or whatever, you know, and see if, you know, if that uh, have a shorter lifespan and so maybe develop cancer earlier or whatever. Perhaps. Uh, and then that can help to inform, you know, how you might interpret, you know, in terms of causation, you know, these observations from all these epidemiologic mm -hmm. studies. Yeah. So we, we touched on muscle, then mm -hmm. we have to touch on height. Because I remember, oh my God, this is in his lecture when he talked about height and cancer relation, like relationship to cancer. Everyone was like, oh my God, especially the tall people. I was <laughs> yes. like, oh my God, I was hoping that would be for the tall people. So can you touch on height a little bit and relationship yeah. regarding cancer development? Yeah, so, so one of the interesting things is one of the, um, and it's not widely known. Uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> is, is that the taller you are, in general, or not you, but populations, the taller people are, uh, then the greater the risk of developing cancer. And that's been seen for lots of different cancers. So, so random, it sounds so random, but yeah, okay. Yeah, it does sound random, yes. you know. And, you know, we've, we've done studies, you know, using the type of epidemiologic study designs that I was describing, these prospective cohort studies where we ask people how tall they are and what they weigh, and we maybe ask them again, you know, how much they weigh and whatever, you know, and, and study after study after study, whether it's colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, whatever, a wide variety of different cancers, the taller you are, even taking into consideration how much body fat you're carrying, uh -huh. you know, so even not even controlling for that, yes. all you are, the greater the likelihood of developing cancer. Okay. Why? Like, seriously, <laughs> so, like... So it's, so the increased risk, I mean, it's, it doesn't approach anything like the increased risk from, mm -hmm. like, smoking cigarettes and lung cancer, mm -hmm. you know, or even eating red meat and processed mm -hmm. meat and colon cancer or whatever, but it's still there. It's a common, you know, so one of, one of the reasons that I think that, uh, first, it's probably reflecting some true biological phenomenon. 
Uh, height is really easy to measure, uh, so there's virtually very little measurement error in that, as opposed to if you ask someone, you know, how much milk they drink, that's not right. going to be measured yeah. nearly as accurately. You know, so the fact that we can even see these relationships with milk suggests that there probably is something really going on, you know, or meat or whatever. You know, so with with height, you know, we see this consistently. It's probably not a so sort of a measurement error thing. And so what people have thought, you know, what that represents is probably something having to do, you no, know, I guess I should say. Uh, what are theories? Yeah, yeah. So, so clearly genetic factors, I, I mentioned this as well, but clearly genetic factors drive how tall someone is. Definitely. You know? So a really tall person is going to have relatively taller kids than a relatively short person, you know. We know that, okay. But we also know that, you know, the, the nutrition that people receive when they're a fetus you know, and even in early childhood, you know, that uh, that can really influence, you know, sort of the maximal height that one attains when mm -hmm. one becomes an adult, you know. So, so part of this thinking is that, well, maybe some ex the exposure to things like, you know, human growth hormone, you know, type things and that type of thing uh, uh, might uh, result in a greater ability to attain, you know, whatever your genetically programmed maximal height mm. might be to get uh, taller height, relative yeah. to, well, I don't know if it, I call it optimal necessarily, <laughs> you know, but I'd say, you know, whatever you may be, you know, genetically, you know, might be your height destiny, there's probably a range of what you might end up with depending yeah, on the all these other possibilities. Factors. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and so what's the maximum? You know, preferred height. I mean, who knows, really? I mean, if you want to be a basketball player, you know, and that type of thing. Yeah, okay, there's yeah. one, one thing. But if you want to do something else, you know, maybe something else. But, but in any case, uh, it's thought that maybe exposure to some of those types of th types of things, insulin-like growth factor, has was mentioned in some of the uh, talks on this uh, cruise. I didn't mention it directly, you know. But um, uh, that's thought to be uh, likely to increase the likelihood of developing cancer. Uh, IG, is it the IGF yeah, IGF, one? Right, I, IGF, one. IGF, IGF like, one insulin like growth growth factor right IGF one um, so and uh, and so so it, that may be part and parcel of overall the same types of mechanisms that make uh, people tall that to make people taller right exactly and so then that might be a marker of you know exposure to those Gee. types of things over one's you know early in one's life or maybe over one's lifetime or something. Um, say if I'm a mom and I have a baby boy and I know that short boys are not as popular as taller right. boys and I want to expose him to a lot of dairy so he would grow so tall, am I possibly um, making him more at risk of developing prostate cancer when he is older? Um, is that something yeah. as a mom that you, you should consider when you're like feeding them dairy? Yeah, I'm, you know, if that's... It's, it's really a tough question. Yeah, it is a tough question. Because so, you so don't I, want... Yeah. them not to be tall. Right. So I have a daughter. She's not particularly tall, but I'm not particularly tall either. So she was destined to not be particularly tall. Me too. So I'm not that <laughs> so, much at risk of cancer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, usually when you're raising a child, you know, the last thing in your mind or one of mm -hmm. the last things is what's their long term, you know, likelihood of developing cancer or heart disease. Something or that comes later. You know, where's it like decades down the road, mm -hmm. you know, so. So I wouldn't necessarily say that this should be that this should be higher on your sort of list of considerations mm -hmm. by any stretch because you want them to be happy and you want them to you know sort of have well good fed, friends and yeah. well fed and yeah. good you know do well in school and have good you know sort of social you know uh, sort of enjoy life and that type of thing. So those would be much more important, you know. And if in order to do that, you know including milk dairy products you know is part of that but on the other hand if you're choosing to include dairy food and milk because you want your son to be taller or bigger or that's whatever, what we do in thailand <laughs> yeah and that's not necessarily that also is not necessarily a reasonable sort of i mean not that it's unreasonable sorry i don't want to say that you know <laughs> it's but, okay you're okay right but not but it's not necessarily it should be the driving force for how you choose you know, what foods to provide to your children, you know, or to your son in this case. Yeah. So, um, so you have raised your daughter. Okay, we, we forgot to mention, I'm not sure, 
I'm not sure if we mentioned um, Dr. Kushi has a daughter, mm -hmm. one daughter mm -hmm. only, right. yeah. um, Angelica, yeah. and uh, she was raised in a microbiotic home. Right. Just mm -hmm. like you. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, so um, we're sec she's second generation from second that perspective. Generation. So we didn't have dairy food at home you know, mm. while she was, she was growing up. Uh, she's uh, pretty active in her life. What does she do uh, for so a living? Uh, so very what she does, active, yeah, right? she's f very physically active. So uh, she teaches yoga for one thing. That's one thing she does. So she's been on this holistic holiday at Sea Cruise, teaching yoga classes. She's in the very morning. pretty. Yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, I think so too. But you know, I'm biased. <laughs> uh, uh, but she also uh, was, uh, and she is a. Um, I don't know what the right word is, but she's an aerial performer. Uh, she was in an off-Broadway show for eight plus years in which part of uh, what they would do is they would like swing from harnesses above the audience and other things like that. Uh, so very, very sort of energy, you know, activity intensive. She's a stunt woman, you know, meaning she sort of shows up as, you know, doing crazy things in TV shows and uh, some movies, you know, it's not like a regular gig, but she gets asked to do these things wow. uh, every once in a while. So, so she uses her body a lot, and uh, and she's had very. I mean, I know she doesn't avoid dairy food per se, you know, but we did not have dairy when, at home when we were Growing raising up. her. You know, right. I mean, she's similar to me in the sense that, yeah, you know, social occasions, you know, we won't necessarily sort of avoid it if, you know, or whatever, uh, or make a big fuss about, you know, the fact that we're being served something with dairy, you know, but, um, uh, but it's not something that she eats regularly. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, you know, try and have a glass of milk every day, you know, or anything like that. You know, she doesn't have milk at home, you know. I don't <laughs> either, you know, so, uh, and like she's, Anyway, she seems she's to be doing strong. pretty well. Yeah. Yes. Um, so she, she, from what I heard from her, is that she doesn't consume meat mm -hmm. and poultry, mm -hmm. um, pretty much. Right. Right. Yep. Um, and fish occasionally, just yep. like you. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, there's one thing that I need to ask is that for we'll segue to soy, um, okay. because there is a lot of misconception. And even before I came on this cruise ship, mm -hmm. that was something I really want to ask someone. Mm -hmm. And you, mm -hmm. I think you explain it so clearly that now I know how to make informed decision about w whether to eat or not to eat soy if you know you might mm -hmm. develop mm -hmm. breast cancer, or even for men. Mm -hmm. So right. please address soy. Yeah, okay. It's like a million dollar question. Yeah, so, so Thank you. You know, generally speaking, like, I, I actually don't know about Thailand, you know, traditional cuisine, but certainly, you know, many Southeast Asian and Asian cuisines have used, you know, traditionally have used soy foods, yes, you know, I as do. part of, you know, sort of what's consumed, you know, and so, uh, and certainly at least from the U.S. context, we know Japanese, you know, soy foods, you know, from China as well and Indonesia and, you know, tofu and tempeh, soy sauce, miso, you know, a, a lot of these foods, a lot of those names. The Japanese versions of those names have become sort of the names used in the United States, and that's partly because of macrobiotics. Actually, you know, with definitely the natural food industries sort of catalyzed by some of the work that my parents did. And your and parents are? Can you please introduce oh, so them just a little bit? Yeah. Um, so they're Michio and Aveline Kushi, uh, and uh, they started one of the first natural food companies, I should say, in the United States, uh, and they formed. Uh, uh, alliances with a couple of natural food companies in Japan uh, to import some of these you know, foodstuffs from Japan, high quality, you know, sort of soy sauce and miso and other things, which were not readily available in the United States at the time. At the time, yes. Uh, you, had to, you had to buy sesame from a bird, like a, a, a pet right. store or pet something, store, right? right, exactly. Oh yeah, sesame seeds, yeah. <laughs> yeah at that time. Good. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, in any case, you know, so it's part of traditional cuisine. So, you know, it's fine it's to, soy, yeah. to eat, you know, boys, girls, men, women, you know, whatever. You know? Everyone was eating uh -huh. soy back yeah. in Japan. Yeah, right. and, mm -hmm. and, and so there's been a lot of concern about whether eating soy might be feminizing or might, you know, sort of increase the likelihood of developing breast cancer, you know, female cancer. Or even know. like growing man boobs or like if you feed it to your boys, they'll grow up to be gays. That's what a lot of like parents, yeah believe okay. in Thailand, like, oh, you want to make them like calmer and be more feminine, feed them soy. Is yeah. that true? So that, 
that sounds a little sort of on the <laughs> What do you think okay. of that so conception? I'll say, with no <laughs> meaning to insult anybody who may be watching this, okay. that sounds really crazy to me. No, <laughs> so, I know. And I can't, I don't un really quite understand the basis for it. But we, here's we just want to be safe. You right, know? Here's what I might <laughs> suppose, okay? So soy in recent years have, has really been characterized as a food that's really high in what are known as phytoestrogens, okay? Yes. And when we so, hear estrogen, we go crazy. Right. So when you hear the word estrogen, uh, then maybe you're thinking, oh, those are female sex hormones. Yeah. And so maybe if you're eating a food that's high in plant estrogens, phytoestrogens, maybe that means that people are going to start developing man boobs or something like that, you know, and, you know, going to become, you know, sort of change their sexual orientation or whatever. But that's not what phytoestrogens are about They're at not. all. Okay. Know? And and basically the, the term, unfortunately, has resulted in a lot of misconceptions of, you know, the sort of the uh, health effects of soy foods. Um, Basically, what that term refers to is that there are these uh, chemical compounds that are found in soy. You know, soy is a particularly rich source of these uh, that interact with estrogen receptors, which are on cells. Okay, so some cells, you know, have a lot of estrogen receptors and some don't. You know, and they can potentially bind to those receptors on the mm -hmm. cells, and by doing so, they can initiate potentially this cascade of reactions that include, among other effects, you know, sort of cell proliferation. That's what the main purpose of estrogens in women are about. Okay? Mm -hmm. So estrogen levels go up, you know, the lining of the uterus, you know, sort of gets thicker, you know, and then estrogen levels go down over the course of a menstrual cycle, you know, and the lining of the uterus gets sloughed off and, you know, you have the period and that type of thing. You know, and so there's this natural sort of cycling of estrogen levels, you know, and um, and then I, as I mentioned, if you become pregnant at the one point, then the estrogen levels continue to rise up. and it shoots up much higher mm -hmm. uh, to support the growth of the fetus. Uh, but uh, and so when people think of that as the reason for estrogens, and then they hear the term phytoestrogens, mm -hmm. then they think, oh, these same compounds are going to cause cell proliferation in mm -hmm. my breast cancer mm -hmm. or something like that. And so it's really bad if I have breast cancer that have particularly breast cancer cells that have a lot of estrogen receptors on them. Yeah. You know? So ER positive breast cancers as is sort of abbreviated in the United States as opposed to ER negative breast cancers. Uh, but it turns out that uh, that uh, these, so when you put the cells like breast in cancer lab, cells right? in a lab, uh -huh. in a Petri dish, and you expose them to these phytoestrogens, yes, they, sell, they proliferate. Mm -hmm. you know? But if you look at it in humans and even in like, you know, rats or something like that that have had, you know, human breast cancer cells, you know, stuck on them, which is mm -hmm. like, sounds really weird, but they do do studies like that, you know. Um, oh my God, you know, the then, things we do. Right, then things don't necessarily quite turn out the same way. You know? As in the lab. Right, because you're producing, you, you know, the mouse, humans are producing estrogens internally already, and those are much more powerful than uh, the phytoestrogens in terms of their estrogenic activity. You know, so, so if if that's the only thing there the a cell is exposed to, then yeah, maybe you know it will promote cell proliferation. But if they're exposed to to those phytoestrogens in the context of other mm -hmm. uh, estrogen sources and that type of thing, so obviously ovaries are one source in women, you know, of estrogens. You know, but also uh, adipose tissue, you know, fat tissue is. So yeah. even if you're postmenopausal, your ovaries are no longer, you know, sort of functioning, you know, as they had before, uh, you might still be producing estrogens uh, from your body endogenously. Uh, and, and so they're much more powerful in terms of those estrogenic cell proliferation effects than uh, the phytoestrogens. Mm -hmm. And so if the phytoestrogens, by bind, potentially binding to these estrogen receptors, might actually be beneficial for cancer risk because they're preventing the binding at of least the, partially of the of real the, estrogen. Right, exactly. You know, so or, or they compete, so the real estrogens, their effect is is dampened somewhat. Mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, so that's part of what may be going on because when we've actually done es research studies, there are now four of these prospective cohort studies in mm -hmm. women with breast cancer. That in every single one of them, two conducted in uh, the U.S. I think one was in the U.S. 
that I was involved in, uh, one in um, Canada, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, and two in China. Uh, each one of those, every one of those studies show that women who e eat, eat more soy so, foods uh -huh. compared with those who eat less have better overall survival, you know, and a couple of them suggest maybe lower recurrence rates. You know, wow. So it actually looks like eating soy for someone who has breast cancer is actually probably good you know, to at least eat on some regular basis. And mm -hmm. the same thing we see you know, with prostate cancer risk. Oh, and, you know, that even for thing. prostate cancer? It's, yeah, it's so the, the soy has protective properties for them? Yeah, for the development of uh, mm -hmm. prostate cancer. Now, there haven't been the same types of studies for men with prostate cancer and whether soy makes a difference you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. you know, but for the development of prostate cancer, there have mm -hmm. been a number of studies that suggest, if anything, it's probably lowers the likelihood of developing prostate wow. cancer. Develop, uh, studies have shown that soy foods lower the likelihood of developing heart disease, Wow. Uh, getting fractures, bone fractures, you know. Right. Uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, eating these traditional soy foods, you know, as part of, you know, sort of traditional healthy Thai cuisine is probably a reasonable thing, you know. So it's not too uh -huh. shy. We, we shouldn't shy away from soy Yeah, shouldn't from shy soy away for it, whatever. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about hip fractures. Before we go there, let mm -hmm. me ask you, say if um, mm -hmm. our kids, you know, in Thailand um, mm -hmm. are off breastfeeding, mm -hmm. um, what types of milk would you recommend based on your yeah. research background uh, that yeah. they should go on after mother's milk? Yeah, so, so of course, obviously breastfeeding is, is best. So that's the first food that all baby have. infants should be getting, you know, for you know, from birth through, you know, at least through six months, but even longer, yeah, you know, and six months may sound long. I don't know what it, what's typical in Thailand. Now, um, now mm -hmm. the UNICEF would recommend two years, um, right. but in mm -hmm. my time, it was only six months. Yeah, and so, I said, right, that's why partly I said, you know, even, you know, longer, longer you know, so, you know, one year, two years, you know, whatever, if, you know, still can, but obviously at, at around six months, babies, you know, maybe a little earlier for some, maybe a little yeah. later for others, they naturally want to start consuming, you know, so, solid, like solid foods, food, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so as that transition happens, you know, then typically, obviously, you don't want to be giving them a lot, you know, a lot of sodium, you know, for one thing, okay. but otherwise, you know, and they may not have developed all their teeth and that type of thing yet, you know, so you want, they need to be soft foods, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but eventually, you know, they'll be able to uh, consume foods that are basically, you know, sort of uh, infant, better for infants in terms of their preparation, mm -hmm. you know, through some of those things, but are basically not that different from what you would be consuming as an adult. Uh, so, um, so we can share food with mm -hmm. them. Right, very exactly. Much. You may need to pre chew it, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that, depending on, you know, their ability to do so and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much. And if you yourself uh, don't have dairy food, I wouldn't be concerned about you know adding in milk. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be concerned about having a milk substitute. Oh, you know, so you don't you don't have mm -hmm. to actually feed them any type of, of milk, milk if they're starting on right. solid food. Yeah, necessarily. Right. Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily be concerned. Now, now people may feel like, oh, you know, how come they get my friends get to have milk and I don't? You know, that, yeah. that might be a concern. You know, so then in that context, yeah, maybe you want to do something. You know, and and I think preferentially, uh, personally, I'd say you know soy milk or something mm -hmm. like that over you know milk from cows, uh, dairy milk or something, but, you know, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, absolutely no way should you ever drink, you know, milk or whatever, um, you know, because there may be social and other reasons that it's actually a reasonable thing to do, yeah. you know, or coconut milk, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. which I think is maybe used in some Thai cuisine and that type of thing. You use a you lot know, of so, that. Right. So I think that that's reasonable. I mean, I don't know about drinking it like, you know, glasses of coconut milk, you know, per se. Yeah, but, you know, too, yeah. yeah, but, you know, but it is used in, you know, cooking and that type of thing. So that's great, I think. You know, so. Mm -hmm. um, about supplements, this one I really have to ask. Um, just two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, Supplements. So when you develop breast, uh, breast cancer or any type of cancer, or if you want to prevent it, mm -hmm. there is a lot of you know marketing about if we take supplements, vitamins, it will help us prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. Are there any types of supplements that you recommend, or do you recommend at all? And does it really help? Because it's a lot yeah. of money. It's so expensive. Yeah. So, so, uh, the, I'll say the World Cancer Research Fund, you know, uh -huh. based in the UK, uh, uh, they. 
and they make recommendations that are, in theory, applicable globally for cancer prevention. Uh, so one of the recommendations currently mm -hmm. is do not take supplements for cancer prevention. There may be other rationales for doing so, like taking specific supplements or whatever, but if cancer prevention is the context in which you're thinking about taking supplements, you shouldn't, there, the evidence does not support taking doing that. Taking supplements, yeah. right. And there have been studies that have, you know, there's been a lot of interest in different mm -hmm. supplements, antioxidant supplements, beta carotene, you know, vitamin C, you know, vitamin E or whatever, selenium as a mineral, you know, that might help prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. No, but when studies have actually been conducted, with vitamins you can actually conduct randomized clinical trials with placebo controls and all that other kind of stuff, you know, because, you know, you can design it to just go into a pill, you know, and that type of thing. Uh, when those studies have been conducted, I mean, not, not all of them, but surprisingly so many of them have shown that the people who are taking the active agent, meaning the beta carotene supplements, mm -hmm. you know, or the vitamin E and selenium supplements or whatever, those people who were thought to possibly have lower risk of developing lung cancer or mm -hmm. prostate cancer or something actually ended up with higher rates. You know, so it, the results actually went the opposite of what was hypothesized and why the study was conducted in the first place. So, so it's good the study was done because people maybe have, would continue to take you know, beta carotene right. supplements thinking it's beneficial when in fact it was maybe increasing the likelihood that they might get lung cancer, for yeah. example. And so that's why the World Cancer Research Fund says don't take supplements for cancer prevention. prevention. Now, if you, there are good reasons to take certain supplements, like if you're a strict vegetarian, if you're a uh -huh, vegan, right. if you're a vegan. no animal food, you know, and that type of thing, uh, really the only good reliable source of vitamin B12 uh, from foods comes from uh, animal foods. Uh, and so... But they uh, don't make B12, right? That's what I learned here. So yeah, amazing. so animals don't... Act, the B12 actually comes from bacteria, you know, so, mm. yeah, so they're the source of the B12, but it gets into animal tissue because, for one thing, actually our, our intestinal bacteria, mm -hmm. a lot, you know, some of them make B12 and stuff, but we don't get to absorb that because of the way we absorb vitamin B12. It has mm -hmm. to be complex to a protein called intrinsic factor, and then that complex allows the B12 to be absorbed, absorbed. into our bodies. Uh, and if it's not complex that way, then that won't happen. Uh, the B12 won't, will just continue down the intestinal tract. And the, the uh, uh, unfortunately, the bacteria that have that great, you know, sort of potential to developing B12 at mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing, it's downstream, so to speak, in our right. intestinal tract from where that absorption would occur. You know, right. so, so we can't benefit from our own gut bacteria, mm -hmm. you know, but we can benefit from uh, those that may exist in some other animals mm -hmm. potentially and in animals such as cows you know that you know have multiple stomachs and a more complicated digestive system in a sense you know they they actually even if they only eat grass you know actually can potentially have b12 levels from their bacteria and also with the exception of like maybe raccoons, you know, <laughs> most other animals don't wash their food, you know, and there's bacteria in the dirt <laughs> and you know whatever. And raccoons you know. wa wash their food? <laughs> so, really? Well, they, you know, oh some, some do, you know, but they don't so like cute. they don't do it as you know sort of obsessively as humans do, you know, whatever. <laughs> like <us. laughs> right? And wow. they don't like you know have you know these you know sort of really sanitary you know, antibacterial sort of food production, right? Yeah. Con you know, commercial kitchens and whatever, you know, but uh, so they probably get, you know, adequate vitamin B12 for their themselves just from eating, you know, even if they're complete vegetarians, you know, as mm -hmm. as uh, animals, uh, uh, but they may eat, you know, the, the bacteria and stuff that produce B12, and mm -hmm. so they get adequate B12, uh, and then we consume animal foods, you know, or whatever, then we get the B12, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so in that context, if you don't eat any animal foods, then taking B12 in a supplement is it's, it's is a reasonable yeah. idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. As an example. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would like to say all of this information is super informative, and I'm very sure I'm very sure everyone who watched this will benefit, and then you know make more informed decisions about what what they would choose, mm -hmm. and it's. 
a great profession that that you have it's oh, well, so it is so great for us um, if we want to learn more mm -hmm. where would you guide us and mm -hmm. that you know um, yeah, so, get more information so and, that, and your social media do you have yeah so the social media I'll start with that uh, even though I have a Facebook account uh, an Instagram is it account active? you know whatever <laughs> they're not active in the sense that I have never posted anything to those. Okay. okay so so they're you know okay so we can't do that so unfortunately I can't you no. know sort of point to those as something that is a potential source of information so or can misinformation see, perhaps. can see your selfies <laughs> right. at the research right. center no yeah no okay, yeah no. you know so so unfortunately that's not there um, other possible sources and websites you know mm. that uh, might provide some information um, you know that I might point to I'm one of the other speakers as part of this uh, conference uh, by the way we're on a cruise right, and it's way, going back to boat, Miami right. <laughs> coming back from the Caribbean yeah. and tonight is the last night and we'll, he will have to go back and pack really soon so right. yes so, so I can so sort of so, yeah. be ready to get off the ship tomorrow morning tomorrow to go morning. to back to fly back to San Francisco uh, but uh, in any case, one of, one of them has a website called nutritionfacts.org. Uh, Dr. Michael, Michael Greger. Greger. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, generally speaking, you know, when I've looked at the things that they have there, they seem pretty good, you know. Uh, so I think that's not necessarily a bad source. You know, some of the organizations that I mentioned, the World Cancer Research Fund, they have a website, wcrf.org, uh, has a lot of information, you know, related specifically to nutrition and physical activity and cancer. Uh, as does the American Institute for Cancer Research, which is uh, a, an affiliate of the World Cancer Research Fund. So a lot of information on nutrition and cancer anyway. Though I would say that those two websites are actually pretty good websites. Uh, very good, reliable information, particularly if you really want to understand and know what these literature reviews that resulted in these recommendations are about. But they also have, you know, sort of educational information and other things, you know, for uh, from that uh, for the general public and that type of thing. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, I'm not certain exactly where I would point to. Certainly, you know, sort of the National Institutes of Health, uh, they're not really that consumer friendly, you know, sort of general public friendly in terms of a lot of good sort of places to go. You know, they do have good information, you know, but it's maybe not, it, it's not as readily accessible in that sense. Um, you know, if I were talking to professional colleagues, you know, then uh -huh. I'd say, hey, go to PubMed if you want to get right. get all the, you know, the actual original research articles. And some of them you might have to pay for. Uh, usually when they're first published, mm -hmm. you know, that issue is often available for free. You know, but then uh, after the next issue comes out, then, you know, the past years, of publications, you know, papers are not available. You have to pay. They're behind a paywall. But then, after a certain amount of time, then older issues become available for free again. For free. Uh, and there may be versions, you know, through what's called PubMed Central, uh, where the submitted manuscript is also available and downloadable for free, even if the uh, actually nicely laid out versions are not. Uh, so. Uh, so that's if you want to read the actual research, original research articles, and you can do you know keyword searches and that type of thing. Uh, you can put in whatever you know, kind of like a Google search. You know, so if you're interested in, but it's like so voluminous in terms of lots of different types of studies and whatever. You, it's, so if you don't uh, sort of know how to know what search you're doing. in a way to <laughs> refine, you know, what pops up to be most relevant to what you're actually interested in, it's not the most. Uh, sort of general consumer friendly website. Uh, uh, so other, yeah, anyway, those are some of the places some that I would places. suggest. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, thank you so much. And yeah. this has been so helpful. I would like to say thank you in Thai. Thank you so much for, for your time and your thank energy you. this late at night. It's, it's, it's so valuable. Yeah. Well, thank you, Vanessa, for the invitation. And hopefully, you know, we'll We'll meet again. again Definitely. Place. I will yeah. keep sending you emails <laughs> and I'll send you the link. All the links will be, I'll be um, putting all the links down so mm -hmm. anyone of you watching this can go to all those websites mm -hmm. that you've mentioned and easily. Mm -hmm. And I will say, you know, when I do go out to eat, like when I'm traveling, I go to, you know, a meeting in DC, Washington, DC, or somewhere else, 
invariably places I look for to eat are Thai restaurants. Thank you. So, and that's because the Thai food, in general, as served in Thai restaurants, even if they're like have no sort of uh, plant-based whole foods, you know, sort of consciousness, invariably you can get some of the best food in Thai restaurants, best vegetarian food, you know, vegan food, you know, in Thai restaurants. Uh, and other, you know, East Asian, you know, restaurants as well, you know, but invariably Thai is like the one that I end up preferring. So thank you everyone in <laughs> Thailand, you know, for being the source of such great food. So. Oh my God, you have made a lot of Thai people happy and <laughs> so. including me. Thank you. Okay. Thank <laughs> Bye. You. Yeah.